They told you. With your personality. With your hair. With your hijab. With your skin color. With your preferences. With your gender. They told you. With their silence. With their words. With their resentment. With their absence. They told you. You don't belong. Yet. Here. You. Are. Hi there, my name's Hannah. I'm a fourth year medical student from the University of Dundee and I'm here representing Dundee University Surgical Society as their president. Hi, I'm Will. I'm a fifth year medical student from the University of Edinburgh and I'm the president of the Edinburgh Student Surgical Society. Hi, my name's Ellie Priestman. I'm a fourth year medical student at Bristol University. I'm also the ACIT Equality and Diversity Ambassadors co-chair, as well as being the vice president at the Bristol Women in Surgery Society. Hi, my name's Charlotte Alside. I'm an ST6 in general surgery in the West Midlands Deanery, and I'm the Dukes Club representative for ASSET. Hi, I'm Michael Okocha. I'm a general surgery registrar in the Southwest, and I'm the Association of Surgeons in Training, Equality and Diversity Officer. I really hope you enjoy this episode of 50 Faces of Surgery. I hope that it leaves you feeling valued inspired, and most importantly, welcome. Here I am. Ms. Nicola Henderson is a consultant general and colorectal surgeon and teaching lead for surgery at the University of Dundee. Educated at the very same university, Ms Henderson spent much of her training at the Nine Wells Hospital before being appointed consultant in 2018, with a specialist interest in emergency paediatric surgery and laparoscopic colorectal cancer. She has a passion for research, even undertaking a year as a clinical research fellow, gaining publications and both national and international presentations. The recognition for her work started early in her career, gaining her commendation um, overall for her degree in medicine and has continued throughout her career with the ASGBI gold medal for the highest marking in the sitting of the FRCS. Um, so firstly, if it's okay, what would you say your usual morning routine is? What do you get up to in the morning? Well, I usually wake up about um, six, half six, depending on what I'm doing that day. And if it's a nice day and I'm not operating, I often go for a run first thing with my dog. I have a boxer, so I take him out for half an hour um, just for a quick run. And then I make some coffee, get my kids up at seven. Um, we have breakfast all together. I quite like having a proper breakfast. I often miss lunch, but I always manage to have breakfast. And then I either take the kids to school or my partner does that and then come into work. I live really near to the hospital, so I don't waste a lot of time commuting. Sort of starting with your background, whereabouts are you from and whereabouts did you did you grow up? So I'm from a small town just outside Glasgow and I went to school um, in my hometown. I am the eldest of three. I've got two younger brothers who are not medical. My parents weren't doctors either. And I had, a, I guess, a normal, boring childhood. It was very unremarkable by its happiness and normality and um, I liked drama, I liked skiing, I liked golf, I had loads of jobs. I had my first job when I was 12 and I was obsessed with earning money, being independent and trying to do a good job and work hard. Yes, hi, hi Miss Henderson. Um, hi. I've got the next couple of questions for you. So the first one, you, you kind of started talking a little bit about your, your childhood. Um, can I ask you even more, what was your life like growing up? Is there anything else you can share with us about that? Um, so I wasn't very confident as a child and I was quite quiet and shy when I was about 10 or 11. I didn't like speaking in class. 
And so my parents decided that I should go to drama school on a Saturday morning. So they sent me to the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama every morning. And I did that for about four or five years, which I guess was good training because now I've ended up in the theatre, although not quite what the RSAMD had in mind. Yes, definitely. Um, and where did you apply for medicine? So when I was in Scotland, when you apply for medical school, you're really young. So it's the start of sixth year. I was only seven, 16, I guess, 17. Um, and I couldn't quite imagine myself leaving Scotland. So I only applied to Scottish medical schools because all my friends were staying put and I wanted to, I wanted to leave home. I didn't want to stay at home. I wanted to get out um, and have that university experience. So I applied to Dundee, Aberdeen, Edinburgh. I think I applied to Manchester as well, maybe. Um, and uh, and that was it. And you had to apply for something else that, in case you didn't get into meds. And so I applied for biomedical science or something like that too. Um, and I got rejected by Glasgow, rejected by Edinburgh, um, and unconditionals from Dundee and Aberdeen. So I came to Dundee because it was less of a drive from Glasgow. What was medical school like for you? Um, it was fun. It was really fun. Um, I loved medical school. I thought it was fantastic. And I knew that I wanted to be a surgeon. So all the other subjects that we did, like psychiatry or obs and gynae, I took quite seriously because I knew this was the only time in my life I was ever going to learn anything about psychiatry or obs and gynae or dermatology. So I actually worked quite hard because I was in a panic that this was my only opportunity to learn this subject. So I, I loved it, it was brilliant fun. I had a fantastic time, made loads of good friends and just really enjoyed it. And, and your training, where were you based during that time in your life? Um, so after medical school, we did things called house jobs. Um, when I graduated, which was like an F1 and I did it in Dundee. And in those days, you just walked up to the person who you wanted to work for with your CV and said, I'd like to work for you and be your house officer. Um, and we had a national matching scheme, but there was still a degree of, not nepotism as such, but they knew who they were gonna have as their house officer and you knew you would work for that individual person. So um, I stayed in Dundee then, and then I applied for the basic surgical training scheme in Dundee. Didn't apply anywhere else because I just bought a house and I liked my nice new house that I bought. Um, and houses in Glasgow were very expensive and I wouldn't have been able to buy such a nice property as I could here. So I was quite settled and planned on staying to do my basic surgical training. And then by mistake, just ended up staying because there was always a job at the right time. And so I just walked from one job into the next job without any deliberate plan really to remain, but that was just how it went. And when you moved on into your consultancy, what was the first week of that like? Um, it was really nice because I knew everybody and not much changed actually for me because I went from being a very senior registrar in the hospital where I'd worked for a long time to being a consultant. So the only difference was that my name was on things and um, it didn't feel hugely different. I think the first week of on call, you feel that fear and anxiety thinking, oh my goodness, what something happens that, you know, I've got to open somebody's chest or do something that's really out of the ordinary that you haven't done before. But after a while, that feeling goes away. But I think more scary was probably my first night shift in A&E as an SHO. That was more terrifying than being a consultant because by the time... I got to be a consultant. I'd been a registrar for so long because I did it part time and I did full time on call. I'd, I'd worked 13 years as a registrar, so there wasn't that much that I hadn't seen or hadn't done. So I didn't find starting my consultant life particularly daunting because it was such a long time coming. And what challenges have you faced along that? 13, you know, 13-year journey? Oh, longer than that. I graduated in 2001. I became a consultant in 2018, so I have 17 years of training. Wow. Um, so I guess that's, to you, shocking. I can tell by your face, you think that's insane. Um, but that was the way it was. So I, I did everything as fast as possible. Graduated 2001, had my MRCS 
two years later. Um, did my MD for two years, then got a registrar job, and then I got pre then I got pregnant. Um, so that was 2006 that I got pregnant. So I should have CCT'd in 2012, but I was six years late because I had two years maternity leave and I worked part-time. So I don't see that as a challenge. To me, it was a huge advantage because I would have been a consultant at 32, which is so young and so, you know, when I think about what I was like at 32, I was really quite daft. And now I'm 42 and I'm absolutely able to take on consultant life and the responsibility and the decisions. But I think I would have been daunted by it had I embarked on that when I was meant to, if you like. Um, I would have been really young. So I don't see that as a challenge, but I suspect other people might that spending that long a trainee. In some ways, it is irritating because people who were your GHO or F1 become consultants much quicker than you in other specialties. So they're the a &E consultant telling you that this patient is being admitted to surgery and you're thinking, oh, ah, listen, you know, I, I put in your first Benflon for you. Um, but I didn't really see those things as challenges. It's just how it was. And I was so happy to have the opportunity to do it all part time and so grateful that it worked for me. So I, I suppose other people might see that as a challenge, but I didn't, which was quite naive of me in a way. But all of my friends who weren't doctors worked part time and had kids. So it didn't strike me as being anything strange that I was doing that too. And it's only now looking back that I realised it was quite unusual. Um, other challenges, I suppose the other big challenge in professional sense was completing my research degree. I did two years of full-time research, which I hated. I absolutely hated being a scientist. I hated being in the lab. They were, they were quite mean, some of them. So I would turn up at eight o'clock, all smartly dressed with high heels on, all excited, ready to do science. And the scientists didn't come in till 10 and they wore jeans and they came in at 10 and went for coffee straight away. And I, would, I wanted to work from eight till five and go home at five, but they liked to work kind of 10 till seven and go home at seven. That didn't suit me at all because I wanted to go to the gym and do the normal things young people do after work. So I didn't really like science, hated working alone, found it really difficult to motivate myself. There was no instant gratification like there is in hospital. If you do a ward round, when you finish the ward round, you feel good because you've seen all the people and they're well and they're happy and you've fixed things. There's none of that in science. It's so hard. It's years till you see your ward. Um, so I found that a challenge. But other than that, um, no, I don't think really there have been particularly big challenges. In terms of the challenges of research, how did you overcome the, that feeling? Uh, I guess just the fear of turning up to a consultant interview with a two year gap in your CV and nothing to show for it. Um, and I was really aware that starting an MD or a PhD and not finishing it was significantly worse than not having one. Um, so I also didn't want to disappoint my supervisor and the thought of disappointing him was way worse than, than the, what was in it for me, to be honest. I just couldn't bear to be the only one who'd never completed. So it was the combined fear, disappointment and failure, I guess, that kept me going. And have you had a moment during your career where you, know, you, you felt that this moment was going to change the trajectory of your career or you felt challenged and you overcame it? Yeah, I've, I've thought about this question after seeing your list of questions today and um, the one that springs to mind is that when I became pregnant just before I was a registrar I was a registrar at the time um, and I just started and I thought can I really do this can I really put my children through their mother as a consultant surgeon and I decided that what I would do is go and spend the day in general practice so I emailed this really lovely GP that I'd worked with him as a medical student and went with a plan of spending the day in his GP surgery. And it was so awful. And by the time we got to lunchtime, I said, I'm really sorry, I can't stay for the rest of the afternoon. I'm going to kill myself if I stay here. This is so boring and so awful. I've absolutely made up my mind. <laughs> I'm going back to the hospital. I am going to put my children through this and there's no way I can be a GP. So that 
that, I guess, was a really defining moment. But after about 20 minutes of being in this GP practice, I realised this was awful. I'd rather stick pins in my eyes than go through this every day. So that was one moment where I realised my commitment was absolute to surgery. Um, but otherwise, another time was when I, I, I like being busy. I like being in the middle of things. Um, and so other specialties didn't feel to me as fun and as busy as general surgery. I had toyed with the idea of doing ENT for a while, but the weekends just weren't exciting enough. And when an exciting thing did happen, the chances are you wouldn't be on call. Whereas in general surgery, every time you're covering emergency surgery, something fun happens and something dramatic happens. So I just love that. It's great. So Ms. Henson, if you could go back in time, um, what would you say to yourself to motivate yourself and to inspire you? So that's difficult, but I think the one thing is to be careful what you wish for, because you can do these things and you can have these things. And a great deal of responsibility comes with this role and a great deal of sacrifice comes with it. And you have to really want it. And you have to really love being at work because you are going to miss Christmas and you are going to miss birthdays and you are going to miss first day of school and friends, weddings, all of that stuff. You'll have to sacrifice from time to time. So you have to really love it. Definitely. And have you got any advice for any aspiring surgeons or medical students? Um, I think what you have to do is find the place that makes you happiest. And surgeons have to be happy in theatre. So you have to really like being in theatre. I think that's crucial that you love being in theatre. And my happy place is standing in the emergency theatre with an open abdomen that I've got everything there. I can fix all the things I can see. And that is my happy place. I, I, I like clinic and I quite like endoscopy. Um, I love doing ward rounds, but theatre for me is my favourite place. So find the theatre that makes you happy, find the type of operation that makes you happy. Um, for me, I like an operation I can control. And some surgical specialties don't feel to me as controlled as general or vascular surgery do. Um, so just find the thing that appeals to you and that makes you happiest, I think. It's, it's been really easy for me and it's been a pleasure. And I kind of feel that all, all of the things that I've done to get here have been hugely worth it. I don't see any of it as being a sacrifice or suffering in any way. It, it's a real privilege to do this job. And I really enjoy it. Yet, here you are. If you